Welcome to part 2 of my Emperor Palpatine character analysis. If you haven't seen part 1 yet, then I highly encourage you to do so. I'll throw up the title card and place a link in the description to it. In today's video, I'll continue my case for Palpatine as the greatest Star Wars character, looking at his role in Episode 3. So without further ado, let's get into it. At the start of Revenge of the Sith, we see the full effect of the war Palpatine has fabricated, with the Clone Wars representing the idea presented in the opening crawl, that there are heroes on both sides, and that evil is everywhere. One could see this as there being heroes for the Republic, such as Obi-Wan and Anakin, and for the Separatists, Grievous and Dooku, with the evil being the leader they both serve in Palpatine. But metaphorically, this could be seen as the evil in everyone, with Palpatine being the one to expose it in the supposed heroes of war, as they've chosen violence over peace. This being seen visually through the Battle of Coruscant, where the planet is a symbol of peace for the Republic as the capital of the galaxy being littered with a chaotic battle between the droids and the clones, a reminder of how close to home the war has become and how commonplace it has become for the galaxy, with Palpatine joyfully overseeing it all. When Anakin and Obi-Wan show up to rescue the Chancellor, we begin to see Palpatine's clear focus on acquiring the Chosen One, as the battle between the Jedi and Sith becomes a tryout for the spot of Palpatine's next apprentice. Unfortunately for Obi-Wan, he has no chance of making the cut. Yet help you no match for him, he's a Sith Lord. Chancellor Palpatine, Sith Lords are our speciality. Well, there's always next year. So as Dooku and Anakin's duel comes to a conclusion, Anakin proves his worth to the Dark Lord, showing that he has the potential for greater power, an attribute a Sith Master always seeks in their apprentice, as the Sith Way, or the Rule of Two, requires one to embody power and the other to crave it. This idea is similar to the survival of the fittest, which is why Palpatine is willing to dispose of his apprentice and Dooku, as he no longer has any value, having already served his purpose. Good, Anakin, good. <laughs> Kill him. Kill him now. Do it. Not only does Anakin pass Palpatine's trial of strength, but more importantly, of giving into temptation, as once down the dark path, forever will it dominate your destiny. You did well, Anakin. He was too dangerous to be kept alive. I shouldn't have done that. It's not the Jedi way. Palpatine reaffirms the justification in Anakin's actions, understanding that his desires are in direct conflict with the ideals of the Jedi. He cut off your arm. You wanted revenge. It wasn't the first time, Anakin. Remember what you told me about your mother and the Sand people? Not only does Palpatine once again justify the execution, but this gives us insight into the growing relationship that the two share, as Palpatine has truly become a father figure to Anakin, as he opened up to him about an event that he never even shared with his brother and Obi-Wan. Leave him, or we'll never make it. His fate will be the same as ours. While Anakin may still not share everything with Obi-Wan, as he does with Palpatine, his care for Obi-Wan still proves to be too strong for Palpatine's full control over him just yet. When they return from the Battle of Coruscant, we see the effect of Palpatine's influence over the Jedi Council, as they use all their resources to end the ongoing war. And I assure you, the Senate will vote to continue the war as long as Grievous is alive. And the Jedi Council will make finding Grievous our highest priority. Of course, this is all by Palpatine's design, using the strategy of divide and conquer, as the Jedi continue to spread themselves thin across the galaxy, and in their fragmented state, they will be easier to defeat. It's because of the Jedi's predictability that Palpatine is confident with how the war will end, which is why he preemptively moves the Separatist leaders to Mustafar, where they could be dealt with when the time was right. Most importantly, with Anakin's recent actions, he still remains the cornerstone of Palpatine's plan, which is why he embraces Dooku's death. His death was a necessary loss. Soon I will have a new apprentice, one far younger. With Anakin being the focal point of his strategy, Palpatine begins to lay the seeds of doubt in Anakin of the Jedi Council, doing this by showing that he's placed an immense amount of faith in Anakin, knowing that the Council has never done the same. I hope you trust me, Anakin. Of course. I need your help, son. With the way he presents the topic to Anakin, it's clear that Palpatine understands the importance emotion has on her actions, as he uses a term of endearment to play into Anakin's own feelings. This then emphasizing the gesture of trust Palpatine offers Anakin. 
I'm appointing you to be my personal representative on the Jedi Council. Me? A master? I'm overwhelmed, sir. Although they both understand that the Council will deny this request, the damage has already been done, as through this act, Palpatine has shown confidence in Anakin, where he's certain that the Council will not. They need you. More than you know. And so, Palpatine's plan goes off without a hitch, as the Council makes him a member, but denies Anakin the rank he desperately desires. You are on this council, but we do not grant you the rank of master. It's never been done in the history of the Jedi, it's insulting. It's through Anakin that we see why Palpatine places a strong emphasis on trust with him, as time and time again, he's blind to the ever-growing corruption of Palpatine. The Senate is expected to vote more executive powers to the Chancellor today. Well, that can only mean less deliberating and more action. Is that bad? The Chancellor is not a bad man, Obi-Wan. He befriended me. He's watched out for me ever since I arrived here. You're asking me to do something against the Jedi Code. Against the Republic. Against a mentor and a friend. That's what's out of place here. Through trust, Palpatine has made Anakin blindly loyal to him. To the point that it not only causes his doubt with the Council. Sometimes I wonder what's happening to the Jedi Order. I think this war is destroying the principles of the Republic. As well as his tension with his best friend. Why are you asking this of me? The council is asking you. But most importantly, his paranoia with his love. I don't believe that. And you're sounding like a separatist. Similar to Palpatine's strategy of dividing the Jedi physically throughout the galaxy, he does the same for Anakin mentally and emotionally with those closest to him, leaving Anakin conflicted, with Palpatine being the one person left that he can truly rely on. Continuing on the theme of dividing Anakin from the Jedi, Palpatine puts his best foot forward to disassociate Anakin from the Council through their conversation at the Galaxy's Opera House. Early on, Palpatine advises that Anakin be skeptical of the Council's choice for who's to lead the most important campaign of the war. I would worry about the collective wisdom of the Council if they didn't select you for this assignment. Not the best choice, by far. Not only does this play into Anakin's ego, as a part of him feels to be deserving of the assignment, but it also paints the Jedi as mere fools if they didn't hand it to him. One thing to note in the conversation is how Palpatine always refers to the Jedi and the Council as a separate entity from Anakin, even though he's an established member, this subtly detaching Anakin from them, as it would encourage him to trust his own judgement and make decisions on his own accord, and not the Council's. You know I'm not able to rely on the Jedi Council. If they haven't included you in their plot, they soon will. The Jedi Council want control of the Republic. They're planning to betray me. With this bold claim, Palpatine is able to plant the idea that the Jedi are plotting to take over. And while it may seem far-fetched in the moment to Anakin, Palpatine then plays the victim. I know they don't trust you. Mm. All the Senate. All the Republic. Or democracy, for that matter. Palpatine presents himself as the victim in this scenario, as if he was all alone and fighting the good fight and everyone was out to get him. Which only causes Anakin to feel sympathetic to his situation. This display of vulnerability by Palpatine directly causes Anakin to do the same, as he opens up to Palpatine about his uncertainties with the Council. I have to admit, my trust in them has been shaken. They asked you to do something that made you feel dishonest, didn't they? They asked you to spy on me, didn't they? With Anakin left more conflicted than ever, Palpatine takes the opportunity to directly challenge the ideals of the Jedi. All who gain power are afraid to lose it even the Jedi. This cynical perspective paints the Jedi to be not as virtuous as they claim to be, as their power gives them an innate fear of loss, a natural human emotion to experience when you gain something of value. The Jedi use their power for good. Good is a point of view, Anakin. With Anakin quick to defend the Jedi, Palpatine echoes a sentiment that even the Jedi would one day find themselves agreeing with. What I told you was true, from a certain point of view. Luke, you're going to find that many of the truths we cling to depend greatly on our own point of view. Palpatine conveys the idea that our viewpoint will have a direct effect on our stance on a situation, which is why he sees the Jedi and Sith as two sides of the same coin. The Sith and the Jedi are similar in almost every way, including their quest for greater power. The idea of perspective is emphasized by how Anakin's view of the Jedi and Sith directly contrasts Palpatine's. The Sith rely on their passion for their strength. They think inwards, only about themselves. And the Jedi don't. The Jedi are selfless. 
The importance here is how Palpatine begins to open Anakin's mind to all points of view, and change his stance on the Sith as inherently evil, as life isn't as black and white as the Jedi painted. This ultimately being the key to Anakin's eventual turn, as no villain truly believes that they're evil. As philosopher Mary Wollstonecraft states, No man chooses evil because it is evil. He only mistakes it for happiness, the good he seeks. Understanding this concept fully, Palpatine pulls the ace up his sleeve. Do you ever hear the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise? Palpatine begins to tell the tale of his former master, with the intent of seducing Anakin to the powers that the dark side has to offer. And it's only fitting that Palpatine tells the story in an opera house, the home of many famous comedies and tragedies alike, as the tragedy of Darth Plagueis is one of the biggest factors that ignites the tragedy of Anakin Skywalker, from chosen one to fallen hero. He could even keep the ones he cared about from dying. As alluded to earlier, Palpatine ensures that he details how the dark side could benefit Anakin, as saving others from death, specifically the love of his life, would be enough of a reason for him to choose evil. He just needed to mistake it for happiness and the good he seeks. He could actually save people from death. The dark side of the force is a pathway to many abilities some consider to be unnatural. While there are benefits to the dark side as the quicker and more seductive route, Palpatine is just as quick to mention the consequences, as adhering to the unnatural dark side of the force will leave you in an unhealthy state of turmoil, constantly consumed with anger and aggression, and a slave to your emotions. And if that's not enough, the power you seek is what others crave. He became so powerful. The only thing he was afraid of was losing his power, which eventually of course he did. This of course being the destructive cycle of the Sith, toxic in nature as a Sith apprentice can only be promoted through one action. Unfortunately, he taught his apprentice everything he knew, then his apprentice killed him in his sleep. While this test of survival of the fittest may be barbaric in nature, Palpatine's immense pride means he relishes in any opportunity to prove just how strong he is as he reminisces the moment he betrayed his master in cold blood, almost fondly. It's ironic. He could save others from death, but not himself. While submitting yourself to the dark side is a dangerous game, Palpatine still accomplishes his mission of manipulating Anakin and piquing his interests. And when he expresses this interest, Palpatine makes it clear that only one path will lead him to what he desires. Is it possible to learn this power? Not from a Jedi. With Anakin now curious about utilizing the dark side, Palpatine must allow the final pieces to fall in place before his big reveal. With the Clone Wars lasting as long as he has allowed it to, Palpatine has managed to divide the Jedi Council both physically and mentally from each other, as key members such as Yoda are spread throughout the galaxy, and trust is lost within the Council towards Anakin. The Chancellor has requested that I lead the campaign. The Council will make up its own mind who is to go, not the Chancellor. So when the Council chooses Obi-Wan to lead the mission that would eventually end the war, Anakin is left more alone and conflicted than ever. I feel lost. Lost? What do you mean? Obi-Wan and the Council don't trust me. This mistrust leads to paranoia, as he can't get Palpatine's words out of his head. I found a way to save you. Save me? I won't lose you, Padme. I'm not gonna die in childbirth, Annie. I promise you. No, I promise you. Palpatine has once again put himself in a great position, with Anakin veering closer to detaching himself from the Jedi entirely, and with the Council now just beginning to catch on. I sense a plot to destroy the Jedi. The dark side of the Force surrounds the Chancellor. Palpatine has everyone where he wants them. All he must do now is wait for his future apprentice to seek his guidance. So the perfect opportunity presents itself when Anakin informs Palpatine of Obi-Wan's mission to end the war, and Palpatine sees that it's clear that Anakin's frustrations are at an all-time high. It's upsetting to me to see that the Council doesn't seem to fully appreciate your talents. Don't you wonder why they won't make you a Jedi Master? Palpatine again plays into Anakin's mistrust of the Council, only fueling his suspicion with more doubt. More and more I get the feeling that I'm being excluded from the Council. I know there are things about the Force that they're not telling me. 
Ironically, where Anakin believes that the Jedi have been lying to him, Palpatine has actually been the one withholding information. A reminder that our presumptions about others stems from our level of trust in them. An attribute that Palpatine has flawlessly gained from Anakin by always showing him compassion. A trait the Jedi of the Republic era severely lack. They don't trust you, Anakin. They see your future. They know your power will be too strong to control. Palpatine, of course, implies that the Jedi are almost jealous of his power, with the goal of holding him back, so naturally, Palpatine offers him a solution. Let me help you to know the subtleties of the Force. How do you know the ways of the Force? My mentor taught me everything about the Force, even the nature of the dark side. Anakin, of course, is hesitant to Palpatine's offer, as he has a predisposed opinion of the dark side, so Palpatine presents it in a way that would be more palatable to Anakin's taste. If one is to understand the great mystery, one must study all its aspects, not just the dogmatic narrow view of the Jedi. Once again, perspective is everything, as Palpatine sees the dark side as knowledge, knowledge that could be used to enhance his overall development as a warrior and a leader. If you wish to become a complete and wise leader, you must embrace a larger view of the Force. This making the dark side more appealing, especially when compared to Yoda's teachings, where the dark side is seen as a drug of false hope that will consume its users. It's also in this scene that Palpatine begins the reveal of his true identity, and so we see the two sides of Palpatine mold into one, as the facade is now truly over. He maintains the charm of Sheev while managing to keep the intimidating presence of Sidious. Learn to know the dark side of the Force, and you will be able to save your wife. From certain death. Palpatine's evil smirk says it all, as he's in Anakin's head both literally and figuratively, as he presents Anakin with an ultimatum disguised as a choice, exploiting Anakin's forbidden attachment and more importantly, using his fear of loss to control his actions, a concept that Yoda warned him about earlier in the film. The fear of loss is a path to the dark side. When Anakin shows further resistance, Palpatine plays the caring father trying to help his son through a hard time. What did you say? Use my knowledge, I beg you. Don't continue to be a pawn of the Jedi Council. And as a father would, Palpatine attempts to encourage Anakin to strive for greatness by reminding him of his potential, feigning genuine care for his well-being, and painting the dark side as almost virtuous in nature. Ever since I've known you, you've been searching for a life greater than that of an ordinary Jedi, a life of significance, of conscience. But of course, the prodigal son is fueled with hatred from learning the truth about a surrogate father, disappointed by the reality of his hero. Conversely, the father is satisfied by his pupil's reaction, relishing in every second of it, as Anakin's rage proves that he's the worthy successor that Palpatine has always dreamed of. Are you going to kill me? I would certainly like to. I know you would. I can feel your anger. It gives you focus, makes you stronger. And while Anakin is at a crossroad, he still decides to give the Jedi one more chance. I'm going to turn you over to the Jedi Council. Of course, you should. But you're not sure of their intentions, are you? Once again, Palpatine alludes to the mistrust that the Jedi have built with Anakin which is why he leaves him with words that show his direct faith in Anakin's ability to make the right choice, meanwhile reminding him of the good that he can accomplish for those that he cares about. You have great wisdom, Anakin. Know the power of the dark side. Power to save Batman. The importance here is that Palpatine gives Anakin the power to choose his destiny, whereas Mace and the Council regularly take that away from him. You must go, Master. No. If what you've told me is true, you will have gained my trust. But for now, remain here. And on the topic of Mace and the Council, this leads perfectly into the fateful night the Jedi attempted to arrest the Chancellor of the Republic. Are you threatening me, Master Jedi? The Senate will decide your fate. I am the Senate. Not yet. The conviction that Palpatine says this with shows how much he believes this to be true. Having had the members of the Senate wrapped around his fingers for years, emphasizing his obsession to be in control over others and every scenario. So when the Jedi challenged this idea, Palpatine is almost insulted. It's treason, then. On the surface level, Palpatine now has rationale to fight back. But when you read between the lines, 
he couldn't be more pleased to give the Jedi this dance. And so, Palpatine fearlessly takes on four Jedi Masters, displaying his raw skill and power, quickly eliminating them one at a time, dividing and conquering his opponent to achieve victory. And it's only fitting that in this duel between the Jedi and the Senate, Palpatine saves Mace for last, as Mace is the man that most represents the Jedi of the Republic era, a stoic warrior that has become blinded by the Jedi Code. And it's also only appropriate that the battle takes place in the Chancellor's office, the location that Palpatine deceived the Jedi countless times, so it's here that Palpatine lays one final trap for the Jedi, as he has no real intention of winning the duel, as he understands that the fate of the galaxy will be decided by the Chosen One. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. Be sure to watch part 2b of this analysis which should already be live. I'll put a link in the description and in the end screens. Part 2 was originally intended to be one video, but splitting it up seemed to be the only way that YouTube would allow me to upload this analysis without any changes due to a ridiculous amount of copyright claims. So I highly encourage everyone to like this video if you enjoyed it, and continue watching in part 2b. It would be greatly appreciated. In any case, I hope to see you all in the next one.